You know, when you're flying to Brazil, when to Rio de Janeiro, there's a great big statue of Jesus. It's a landmark of Rio day and night. It stands 130 feet high. It's 130 feet from fingertip to fingertip with his arms outstretched. Someone has called this, in this country, the Year of Jesus. One of the networks recently ran a mini-series on Jesus. My daughter has written a book called Just Give Me Jesus. There's a movement among teenagers that asks the question, what would Jesus do? Almost everybody has heard of Jesus, but millions don't know, really know who he is. They don't have him in their lives and in their hearts. And the world today is looking for a Messiah to come and save us. Many years ago, the prophet Ezekiel said, I searched for a man among them, but I found none. In other words, God was searching for someone that he could put his hand on and bless and use, and he couldn't find anybody that was willing to totally surrender and commit their lives to him. The world today, if you read the newspapers and watch the telecast, news telecast, is rushing madly toward, I think, Armageddon. Tonight in the Middle East, they're battling again over the same things they've battled for hundreds of years. They've had meeting after meeting and truce after truce and treaty after treaty and promises made by all around. But somehow they can't quit their fighting. You see, man is a moral failure. God is our only hope. God's plans God's plans are already formed and are clearly stated in the scriptures. And at his right hand in heaven sits a man who was despised and ignored and rejected by men when he came to earth the first time and who is still rejected and ignored by the majority of the human race. God has pledged that he will be the future world ruler. He will put down all rule and all authority and power. There's coming a day when every knee will bow to him and every tongue will confess his name. This year, 2000 AD, the calendar we use each day dates back to the birth of Jesus. We can't get away from him. Our generation cannot escape Jesus. Over the years, so many plays and books and operas and movies have been made about Jesus. In March and April, both Newsweek and U.S. News and World Report magazines had cover stories about him. In its Science and Ideas cover story, U.S. News carried the title, Why Did Jesus Die? Why is there so much interest in Jesus today? Is that the question you've asked? Who is this person? Who has done so much to transform human history than any man that ever lived? He only lived 33 years. His longest journey was less than 100 miles. Is he just a folk hero or a revolutionary? Or is, who he, is he who he claimed to be? The son of the living God. Who is this person? that demands we call him son of God and follow him even to death. We know he was a man. He was completely human. He was the representative man. He was the all out man. He was identified and numbered with the transgressors, the scripture says. 83 times in the New Testament, he's called the son of man. There are many places in the scriptures where we are reminded of his humanity. The Bible teaches that he was hungry. The Bible teaches that he was tired. In the back of a boat, he was asleep. He knew the joys of friendship. He was misunderstood and despised. He wept at the tomb of a loved one. He had to fight temptation and endure disappointment. He claimed to be the unique son of God. 
before the world ever was or before the human race ever existed. He said, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And Jesus said, before Abraham was, I am. With these words, Jesus set himself aside from every other person that ever lived. In other words, Jesus said, before Abraham was born, I always am the eternal present. There's no past with Jesus and there's no future with Jesus. It's all in the ever present. And he's speaking to you tonight and he's speaking to all of us collectively and individually. In Colossians 1 it says, For by him were all things created that are in heaven and that are in earth, visible and invisible, whether they be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers. All things were created by him and for him. And he is before all things, and by him all things hold together. This whole stadium would fly to pieces were it not for the fact that he is the thing that holds it together. Peter's statement in Matthew 16, 16, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. When he came at Bethlehem, that was not his birth or his beginning. He had already, already, already existed. That was his incarnation. When Jesus came to Bethlehem, it wasn't the place of his origin. It was his incarnation. And the Word was made flesh and dwelt among us. You know, it's interesting to me that Jesus never apologized for sin. He challenged others to prove any error in his thinking or in anything that he ever did. How do we explain Jesus from every other individual that ever lived? How do we explain Jesus from every other person? What is the basic cause of hate and greed and lust and war today and racial injustice and racial division? Jeremiah said, gave the answer. The heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? King David said, in sin did my mother conceive me. I was born in sin, said David. He said, I was shapen in iniquity. The Bible says in Matthew 15, For out of the heart proceed evil thoughts, murders, adulteries, fornications, thefts, false witness, and blasphemies. I think we need to do something about guns. But that's not the real problem. The real deep problem is in our hearts. For out of the heart proceed evil thoughts and murders and adulteries and thefts and blasphemies. All of these things come from the heart of men and women. How do you explain Jesus? His authority. No one ever spoke as this man spoke, says John 7. He forgave sin. No other prophet had ever forgiven sin. Muhammad didn't attempt that. Buddha didn't do that. No one else in history has ever said your sins are forgiven. He also had authority over nature. When the sea was boiling and the storm was raging, he just held up his hand and said, Peace be still, and the sea quieted down and the storm stopped. He had authority over disease. Every sick person that ever came to him by faith and he touched, he healed. But what about his death? Different than any other person that ever was. You see, Jesus was executed. He was a criminal. He took our sins. He became sin for us who knew no sin. Can you imagine a person being the embodiment of sin? That's what Jesus was on the cross. Isaiah 53 says, God hath laid on him the iniquity of us all. In 1 Peter 2.24 it says, Who his own self bare our sins in his body on the tree. Micah says that all of our sins are cast into the depths of the sea. I was reading today about that lake in Russia. That's the deepest water in the whole world. 
thousands of feet down. Our sins are buried in the depths of the sea, the scripture says, because of what Christ did on the cross. He became sin for us. He was executed for you. He took your judgment and your hell. You won't ever have to go to hell. You don't ever have to go before the great white throne judgment if you're in Christ. But everybody else will. The Bible says that there's coming a day when he's going to judge the whole world. And you will stand before God at the great judgment, hundreds of you that are here tonight. And you won't stand with a great crowd like this tonight. You say, oh, we'll have a good time when we get there. No, you'll be alone. You're going to stand before God alone and give an account of what you did with Jesus and how you lived your life. And many of us are going to be terribly disappointed. And we're going to scream for mercy. But it's going to be too late. The Bible says that we will call for the rocks and the mountains to fall on top of us and hide us from him that sits on the throne. But we can't. And the crucifixion of Christ is a stumbling block to many people because it's foolishness, the Bible says, to those that perish. Many will accept the teaching of Christ when he says, love everybody. But they stop at the cross. At the cross is where you have to come before you can really know him. And you have to confess that you're a sinner. And you have to repent from sin. And the word repentance means that you turn, that you change. You're going one direction in your life and you're willing to go another. You say, but Billy, I don't have that ability. I've tried to change. I've tried to do better, but I can't. No, you can't. But God will help you if you submit to him and say, Lord, I need your help. I need your help even to repent. I need your help even to have faith to believe the kind of faith that I must have. What about you? And then there's his resurrection. The Bible says that they took him out and they buried him after his death. But on the third day he rose again. And he's alive tonight. When some of the disciples went out to the tomb where he was buried, there were two men there, two angels, that said, why do you seek the living among the dead? He's not here. He's risen. Jesus is alive. And the thing which inspired the disciples to go to the whole world with the gospel is the resurrection. We're talking about a living Christ that can come into your life and heart today and change you. And change your family and change your neighborhood and change Nashville and change Middle Tennessee and change all of the whole country if we'll let him. The Bible says that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, we shall be saved. You have to believe that he not only died but that he rose again. That's one half of it. One half is that you repent. You come and say, oh Lord, I'm a sinner. I'm sorry that I've sinned. Please forgive me and help me to change. But then you have to live the life. And there the resurrected Christ is there through the Holy Spirit to help you live the life after you've come to Christ. If Christ is not risen, then he's not God. And the tremendous force in history is unexplained. The Apostle Paul on the road to Damascus was persecuting Christians and killing Christians. He hated Jesus. And one day there was a blinding light and he fell down on his knees and he knew it was Jesus. And he said, Who art thou, Lord? in Acts the ninth chapter. 
And this is the question you must answer. Who is Jesus? That's the question of our generation. Who is Jesus? Jesus claimed, if Jesus claimed to be God, knowing that he was not, he was a deceiver. If he thought that he was God and didn't know the difference, he was a maniac. Jesus was whom he claimed to be. God manifested in the flesh. Think of it, the mighty God that created those stars and those planets and this whole universe and holds it all together. He is the one that wants to come into your life, in your heart tonight, in a new way. Oh, you might be a member of the church, you might have been confirmed and baptized and all the rest, but deep down inside you're just not sure. You're not certain that you're ready to meet God. You're not certain that you'll escape that great judgment. You must face the question that Pilate asked. What shall I do then with Jesus, which is called Christ? Pilate washed his hands. Tonight you can wash your hands and leave. And leave this stadium and go back to the old life and nothing has happened. But Paul was fearful. He was trembling. He was astonished. He was amazed. But he asked the right question. Lord, what wilt thou have me to do? And Jesus said unto him, Arise and go. And that's what Jesus is saying to you tonight up in those stands and down here on this little stand. Arise and go. Get up out of your seat and make a new commitment to Jesus and make certain that your sins are forgiven. You see, this may be the only chance you'll ever have the rest of your life is tonight. You may not be able to come back to these meetings this week. You may never have another moment quite like this when the Holy Spirit has spoken to you as he's speaking tonight. And Jesus says, and Revelation 3.20 Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hear my voice and open the door, I'll come into him and fellowship with him. Jesus is knocking at your heart's door tonight. He wants to come into your heart. He wants to change your life. He wants to have an impact in your community and in your family and in your life. He wants to give you peace and joy that you've never known before. He wants to forgive all your sins and he wants to give you assurance that if you died tonight, you'd go to heaven. You can have that assurance tonight before you leave here. And I'm going to ask you to do something that may be very difficult for you to do. But when Jesus died on that cross, he was dying for you because he loved you. And he's asking you to come into Open your heart to him tonight. And if there's a doubt in your life about your relationship to Christ, you get up out of your seat right now and come and stand in front here on this beautiful stadium floor that they've put down. If you're with friends or relatives, they'll wait on you. And come and stand here and I'm going to say a word to you and have a prayer with all of you and give you some literature to help you before you in your life in the week to come. You get up and come right now, men, women, young people, hundreds of you, just get up and come and stand here. That's all. By that act, you're saying to God, I do open my heart to Jesus who died for me and who rose again and who's alive tonight. And he's knocking at my heart's door. I can sense it. You get up and come. We're going to wait on you right now. If you've come with a group, they'll wait on you. If you've come in a bus, they'll wait. There's plenty of time. This is the most important moment in your life. Don't miss it. Quickly, from the, up in the top stands, you get up and come. It'll take you a little time. It'll take you four or five minutes, so come. We're going to be here to pray with you and to talk with you and to help you.
while you're still coming, I want to say a word to all of you that will be watching by television. And you can make your commitment where you are. Wherever you are, you may be at home, you may be in a hotel room. I don't know where you are, but God is speaking to you. You make your commitment. Or you can call that number that you see on the screen. And there's somebody ready to talk to you right now and have a prayer with you. And we'll send you the same literature that we're going to give to people here tonight. You can make your commitment. You make it now. just prayed that prayer with my father or if you have any questions about a relationship with Jesus Christ, I would just call that number that is on the screen. There'll be someone there to talk with you, pray with you, and answer those questions. And remember, God loves you. If you would like to commit your life to Jesus Christ, please call us right now toll free at 1-877-772-4559. That's 1-877-772-4559. Or you can write to us at Billy Graham, 1 Billy Graham Parkway, Department C, Charlotte, North Carolina, 28201. Or you can contact us on the web 24-7 at peacewithgod.tv. We'll get the same helps to you that we give to everyone who responds at the invitation. On behalf of Franklin Graham and the Billy Graham Evangelistic Association, thank you for watching and thank you for your prayers. You're invited on a journey of discovery at the Billy Graham Library. Retrace Billy Graham's path from humble farm boy to international ambassador of God's love through multimedia, photos, and memorabilia. But the fruit of the Spirit is love! That is a supernatural... Tour the restored Graham family home place, browse Ruth's Attic Bookstore, and have a meal at the Graham Brothers Dairy Bar. Enjoy special exhibits, events, and seasonal activities for the whole family. Admission is free, so come walk this journey of discovery at the Billy Graham Library. We are to wait for the coming of Christ with patience. We are to watch with anticipation. The scripture says, Christ is coming when you're least expecting him. Coming as a thief. He said, be prepared. From our archives, the Billy Graham Classics. My message is going to be brief and my text is going to be Luke, the 23rd chapter beginning at verse 42. Remember me when thou comest into thy kingdom. And Jesus said unto him, Verily I say unto thee, Today thou shalt be with me in paradise. The greatest and most historical event of all of history was when Jesus Christ died on that cross and when Christ died on the cross, the lightning flashed, the thunder roared, the darkness came as the nails had gone into the hands of Christ and a spear had gone into his side and the nails through his feet and Jesus was hanging between heaven and earth, suffering for us. The soldiers had taken him out of his prison and they'd put a crimson robe on him. They'd beaten him two or three times. And then they took two or three murderers with him, two of them in particular who were going to be crucified with him. And then they took him across Jerusalem and they made each one of them bear a placard or at least a herald went before them to bear a placard telling of their crimes. And then Jesus stumbled and fell. He was weak from the loss of blood. And they compelled an African to help him carry his cross. And as long as the history of man shall go, we will always remember that it was an African 
that helped Jesus bear his cross. There are people today that say that Christianity is the white man's religion. Don't you believe it? For all of those who believe in Jesus Christ, he belongs to all people. He came from that part of the world that touches Asia, Africa, and Europe. He belongs as much to the African as he does to the European, and as much to the European as he does to the Asian. Jesus Christ belongs to all people, but an African helped him carry his cross. And then when they got to Golgotha, these soldiers went about their work, nailing the nails in. These two murderers and thieves that were being crucified with Jesus were yelling, screaming, crying. But Jesus never uttered a word. And they took some medicated wine that acted as a sedative and gave it to the two thieves and they took it and they offered it to Jesus and he refused it because he wanted to drink the very bitter dregs of death in our place for us. He wanted to suffer all of death, showing that God loved the world and God was willing to forgive the sins of the world because of what Christ was doing on that cross. The people that were watching were laughing and sneering. They said, he saved others. Why can't he save himself? Come on, you worked great miracles. Why don't you work one more? You raised Lazarus from the dead. You raised a widow's son from the dead. Why can't you save yourself? Those blind people did not realize that God had foreordained and predetermined that Jesus Christ was to die the death of the cross. And it was only through that death that the world could find forgiveness and salvation. There is no other name given among men whereby we must be saved. The Apostle Paul was an intellectual, one of the most brilliant men that ever lived. And Paul went to Corinth, pagan, intellectual, immoral Corinth, the university center of the ancient world, and Paul said, I'm determined to know nothing among you save Jesus Christ and him crucified. Why did Paul say that? He said that because God has locked up in the cross the secret of the universe. The only way that earth can ever find reconciliation with heaven is by way of the cross. The only way that you can ever get to heaven is by way of the cross. And if Jesus Christ had not gone to the cross, you could have never had sin forgiven. You could have never gone to heaven. And the problems of earth would have never had a solution. Only by the way of the cross can we find our way back to God. And that's why it was important that Jesus stay on the cross. Because you see, Man is in rebellion against God. Adam and Eve rebelled in the Garden of Eden. And every man since Adam and Eve has broken God's law and sinned against God. And as a result of that, God and man are separated. And man's only way back to God is through Jesus Christ. Man had broken the law. Man deserved death. He deserved judgment. He deserved hell. But God said, wait a minute. I'll give my son. I'll let him die. I'll let him take the judgment and the hell for you. And if you will put your trust and your faith in my son, I will forgive your sin. I will change your life. I will give you an inner peace and joy and satisfaction that you would never find in any other way. So Jesus was dying on that cross for your sins and your sins. Some people say, why don't you try to make your gospel relevant? The most relevant message in the world tonight is the fact that Christ died for you. 
He died in your place. He shed his blood for you. And without that experience, no one can get to heaven. Yes, Jesus Christ died and the people laughed and sneered. And two people that sneered and laughed the most were these two thieves and murderers that were dying with him. They were both mocking him, but one of them became strangely silent. And finally, this one that was silent turned and rebuked the other thief in the air of the murderer and said, we are dying justly. We deserve to be crucified, but not this man in the middle. He's a good man. He's the son of God. Then he turned to him and asked him what seemed to be an improbable, an impossible question. He said, remember me when thou comest into thy kingdom. Will you remember me, Lord? And then Jesus gave one of the most astounding answers in the history of the world. The angels in heaven must have been shaken and startled and amazed when they heard what Jesus answered. Jesus said, today, today thou shalt be with me in paradise. Think of it. Here was a thief. A murderer, a man that had committed every crime in the books, dying, turns to Jesus in his dying moment and says, Lord, remember me. He didn't even say, forgive me. He didn't even say, Lord, take me to heaven with you. He didn't say, Lord, prefer me. He just said, Lord, remember me. And Jesus answered quick as a flash and said, Today thou shalt be with me in paradise. And to all of you people that think you can't be converted in a moment and that you cannot be saved at this hour and at this moment in this rain in Baton Rouge and have your whole life transformed, you read the stories of the New Testament and the encounters that people had with Jesus. There are many of you that came here tonight in this rain that never dreamed that you were going to meet Jesus. You came out of curiosity or you came because your bus was already on the way or you had already promised some friends to come or you're a student here at the university and you came out of curiosity. Many of the people of the New Testament that came to Jesus never planned it. They never thought that they would have their lives changed. This thief on the cross that had been in prison, knew that he was going to die on a cross, he knew he deserved it. He never dreamed that before the night came, that day, he would be in heaven. He deserved judgment. He deserved hell. I'm going to see that man in heaven someday by the grace of God. He wasn't saved by his good work. He didn't even have time to be baptized. He didn't have time for anything. But he's in heaven. That's the grace and the mercy of God. And I want to tell you that the greatest word in all the language of men is forgiveness. That day Jesus forgave him of every sin he had ever committed. Wiped the slate clean. And he was in heaven. There are three things about this passage. The whole gospel is in it. There's repentance. It's the only deathbed repentance in the whole Bible. I don't know what led this fellow to ask that question or to make that statement. It might have been the prayer that Jesus had just prayed, Father, forgive them, they know not what they do. It might have been what Jesus had said to John concerning his mother. I don't know what it is or what it was, but the Holy Spirit used it. The Holy Spirit used it to convict him and to convince him that he needed Jesus and he repented of his sins at that moment and he was saved. I can imagine the other thief saying, why, what have you done? Have you turned preacher or something? 
You remember we strangled that old merchant for his gold? Remember you kidnapped that little child? Remember that girl you raped? Remember that person you slew? You think God's going to forgive you? Are you turn a preacher? He can't forgive you. I don't care what your sin is. I don't care how deep in sin you've gone. I don't care what you've done. God can forgive you. God can cleanse you. God can make you a new person tonight if you put your faith and your trust in him. Yes, he repented. And the second thing he did was to believe. The Bible says if we believe in our heart that God hath raised him from the dead, we shall be saved. The scripture says, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shall be saved. But as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name. Just repent and believe, and then you'll be saved. He said, when thou comest into thy kingdom, as though he were thinking of some far off kingdom age somewhere. And Jesus answered and said, today, right now, you'll be saved. Right now, you can have eternal life. You can put your trust and your confidence in Christ now. And he did. And that day, he went to paradise. Now, it's the word remember that I want you to think about a moment. He said, Lord, remember me. Did you know that God forgets? Did you know that there's a scripture in Jeremiah 31, 34 that says, I will forgive their iniquity and I will remember their sins no more. God can forget. God can forget your sins. What does God forget? God never forgets the universe. He sends the rain. Yes, sir. God sends the rain. But the rain falls on the just and the unjust. The sun comes upon the just and the unjust. God blesses all of us with all of his blessings. He never forgets. Suppose he forgot the sun rain. Suppose the sun ceased to shine. The earth would turn into a glacier. Suppose God would forget because the scripture says that God holds the whole universe together. And if God ever took his hand off, it would blow to pieces. And then the scripture says that God remembers you. Tonight, I had in my little office here where I see people, a lady and her children and a mother and their son and their husband is a prisoner in North Vietnam. I don't think any of us will ever know what these families have suffered. I don't think any of us will ever know what those boys out there have probably gone through psychologically and physically, never knowing. And then we had another one come and see us tonight and her husband, she's just found out, is, a, is alive and a prisoner, but for a long time she didn't know. He was only missing an action. But let me tell you this, God remembers them. And when we bowed our heads in the little office and prayed that God would remember them and that his grace and his love would reach out to North Vietnam to the prison camp and touch them. God remembers them and God answers prayer. How many times has God been with you? You don't even know. Because you see, you almost had a wreck the other day. But you were saved from it. Why? When you get to heaven, you may find out why. It might have been divine intervention. And that happens to all of us. God remembers you. And then God never forgets our sins either. The Bible says, be sure your sin will find you out. The Bible says, God is not mocked for whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. The Bible says, for God shall bring every work into judgment. God is going to judge every sin that's ever been committed. What is your sin that so easily besets you? It's going to be brought to light, all the secret things. God is going to judge it. God never forgets sin. No sin has ever been forgotten by God. God has recorded everything you've ever done and all the things you've ever thought from the time you were born till the time you died. 
It's all there. It's all in the record books. And God will never forget. Nothing is going to be forgotten. How do you stand before God? But there's one thing God can forget. He can forget sin because of Christ. The Bible says in 2 Corinthians 5, 21, He hath made Him to be sin for us. It says in Isaiah 53, The Lord hath laid on Him the iniquity of us all. It says in 1 Peter 2, 24, Who His own self bare our sins in His own body on the tree. The Scripture teaches that God can forget our sins because of Christ. The sin that would damn us, the sin that would send us to judgment, the sin that would send us to hell, God can forget. In Hebrews 1, 3, it says your sins are purged. In Isaiah 43, it says your sins are blotted out. In Psalm 103, it says your sins are put away. Isaiah 38 says your sins are put behind his back. And in Hebrews, it says God can remember your sin no more. Ladies and gentlemen, because Christ died, because he rose again, because of what he did, God cannot remember my sin. I've committed plenty of sin in my life. And even if I'd only committed one sin in my whole life, it's enough to cause me to go to the judgment and be lost. Because I could keep the whole law and yet offend in one point, and I'd be guilty of all. But God has forgotten my sin. He forgot every sin that I have ever committed. Everyone he has forgotten. He's the only person in the whole universe that can forget. He has the ability to forget. Has he forgotten your sin? Have you brought your sin and laid it at the feet of Jesus? What a night to give your life to Christ. You may never have another moment like this. The Bible says, He that hardeneth his heart, being often reproved, shall suddenly be cut off, and that without remedy. You've sat here for over two hours in the rain. Many of you are soaked all the way through. And you've done it because you want your sins forgiven. Many of you and others of you have sat here because you're praying for somebody that needs Christ. And this is your hour and your moment and it may never come again like this. I'm going to ask you to do something that I saw people in London do. I saw people in San Diego do. I saw people in Pittsburgh do. I'm going to ask scores of you to get up out of your seat right now and come across this field in the rain and stand here and by coming say, I want Christ in my life. I want my sin forgiven. I want to know I'm going to heaven. I want to know that I will not be at the judgment in that final day. I want my life transformed by the power of Christ. I'm going to ask you to come right now, men, women, young people, God has spoken to you. You need Christ. And in a moment like this, you'll never forget it. I met a missionary out in the Far East a few months ago. Said, I received Christ one of those nights at Wembley Stadium in the pouring rain in England and stood ankle deep in mud to find Christ. And said, I thank God because if it hadn't been for the rain, I don't know whether I would have come that night or not. But he said there was something about the challenge of coming forward in the rain that challenged me and it changed my life. Yes, it's not easy to come, but Christ went to the cross for you. And many people are on the way now. You get up and come and make your commitment to Christ. As hundreds are responding to Mr. Graham's invitation to make a public commitment to Jesus Christ, you can make that same commitment right where you are. Just pick up the phone and call the number you see on your screen. Special friends are waiting to talk with you and pray with you about this most important decision. to all of you that have come. 
You've come tonight to make your commitment to Christ because you want your sins forgiven. You want to know you're going to heaven. You want a new direction in your life. And you've come to make a commitment to Christ because you want him to forget your sin and save your soul. Well, I want to tell you, he remembers you and he loves you.